think I'm going to tie that out. Yeah, there's a superstition amongst a lot of fishermen that uh, bananas are bad for a fishing day, and it's it's a superstition amongst some sea turtle biologists, including myself, that we disallow, prevent, prohibit anyone from coming on the boat and bringing a banana. Bananas are bad luck. It's funny how you're all scientists, but you're uh, still keeping this superstition alive. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Crowd Science from the BBC World Service. I'm Anand Jagatia and before we get going I just need to check, you don't happen to have any bananas with you right now? Oh, okay good, because as you've just heard you won't be allowed on board if you do. We're on the deck of the RV Lavinia, a vessel that's specially designed for our mission today, capturing sea turtles. It's a flat bottom boat that's perfect for manoeuvring through the shallow waters off the coast of Florida. So we've got to navigate out the river channel and then into the Gulf of Mexico and then out to our study site. So are we in the zone now and in the yeah. area where you yeah. guys are? This is one of the overwintering sites offshore, the deeper water. We're joining a team of researchers from the Sea Turtle Conservancy. Lead biologist is this guy, Rick Heron, from the University of Florida. We can chase and, and capture in, this, in these conditions. Okay. Might see butts sticking up in the sand and in the algae. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so look closely. When we see a turtle and we start chasing, hang on to the boat. You ready, Anand? Yeah, we need, we just need I to I think so. That. Okay. You know you're catching them, right? <laughs> That's a little green turtle right there, right side. It's turning hard. I see it. I see it. We thought it was a fish. Can somebody get a waypoint? Turning towards us. That's a ray. Avoid that. Rick really That's isn't side. kidding about hanging on tight. Green turtle? Someone spots a turtle and the boat roars into life, swinging round in hot pursuit of the blurry green shape that's flying through the water. Wow, that's hot. Back into the swamp, right here, right here. That's the second turtle. Two turtles, one on the right, there's one in front of us. That's the one we're chasing. It's right in the right front. Here, right on the left, on the left. Too fast, too fast. Watch out for the crab trap. Left. Coming back right. In front of the boat. So why are we on this high octane chase? Well, sea turtles are some of the most skillful navigators on the planet. They can swim thousands of miles across entire oceans and somehow come back to the exact same beaches where they were born to lay their own eggs. How do they do it? That's what we're investigating in this episode of Crowd Science, which is the second of a two-part special on animal migration. And it all started with a question from one of our listeners, Moses in Kenya, who asked us this. Hi Crowd Science. My question is, how are long distance migrating birds like the Arctic Tern able to navigate vast oceans and distances in flight? How come they never get lost? Similarly, how do turtles not get lost traversing thousands of miles under ocean water? Cheers Moses. In the last episode, we travelled to the jungles of Belize and saw how scientists can follow the remarkable journeys made by migrating birds. This time, we'll take a closer look at how birds manage to find their way on these epic voyages. And we'll be trying to understand the amazing abilities of sea turtles. But they are elusive creatures, and getting hold of them for study isn't easy. Which brings us back to the RV Lavinia. Our quarry, a sea turtle we've been chasing for several minutes, has slowed down. We're in neutral, so if you want to go... One of the team, Evan, has just dived headfirst off the deck into the water, and when he emerges, he's got his arms wrapped around a turtle. Once the turtle's been safely lifted on board, I asked Evan how he made that look so easy. So when you're jumping, you have to think, I'm going to catch that turtle. Because if you hesitate at all, you're not going to catch it. Impressive as it was to watch, it certainly seems like a lot of effort to go to, but Rick assures me that this is the best way to capture a turtle. It's the safest way, researchers, we can catch them. If we were netting for turtles, which I've done a lot of, you know, there's a possibility of actually drowning them in the net. But when hand capturing, we end up catching less turtles in a given amount of time, but we can actually pick and choose which ones we're going to grab, and it's safer. 
for for the turtle anyway might be a little <laughs> dangerous for us sometimes <laughs> we can't hold our breath that long <laughs> We'll be returning to this turtle catching mission soon to learn more about this animal and where it migrates to on its underwater odyssey, as well as how it finds its way through the ocean. But first we need to pick up on some unanswered questions from our previous episode. If you missed it, you can download that on BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcasts. In that show, we heard about some of the astonishing journeys made by migrating birds, and we also met this man, who tries to follow where they end up. Let's imagine we put a, a ring on the leg of a Manx shearwater as it's breeding in a burrow on an island off the west coast of Britain. Next year we can go back to the very same hole in the ground and we will, with 95% certainty, find the same individual in there breeding again. This is Tim Guilford, Professor of Animal Behaviour at the University of Oxford. Tim studies a species called the Manx shearwater, a seabird related to the albatross. This individual has gone all the way to the rich waters off of the Patagonian shelf off southern Argentina for the winter and then migrated back through the Caribbean and across the North Atlantic. It can come back with pinpoint accuracy to exactly the same burrow. How does it do that? It is hard to get your head around. How do birds like the Manx shearwater even know which direction they need to set off in? I think a useful distinction here is to think in terms of maps and compasses. If we think about what a compass does, this is a device, a mechanism that allows you or an animal to fly in a set direction over very long distances without actually needing to know your location all the time. And the compass is really extremely important in our explanations of, of bird migration. So what kind of compasses are available? Well, there are three main systems for which there is now good scientific evidence. The first is the Earth's magnetic field. There are lots of experiments now which demonstrate that if you manipulate the orientation of the magnetic field in which a bird is sitting or hopping inside a cage, then it will predictably change the direction in which it hops, at least during the migration period. This is part of the internal drive to migrate, and it has a directional component. We'll be hearing more about the magnetic sense later in the show, but Tim also told me about other ways they can orient themselves. Many small birds migrate at night and they make use of the stars to give them a set compass direction with which to achieve their migration. Polaris, or the North Star, appears to be fixed in the night sky while the other stars rotate around it, so it's a very useful reference point which birds can learn to use. If you rear them in a planetarium in which the sky is artificially rotating around a different star than the North Star, then they will orient with respect to that new star. And this allows them to identify the directional information from the starry sky. So that's the night sky and the Earth's magnetic field. But of course, many birds are moving during the day and there is a really prominent compass cue available during the day, and that's the sun. And almost every animal that's been tested scientifically is shown to use the sun to orient under some con one condition or other. There are kind of a few different examples of compass-based navigation that different birds might have, which kind of tells you that you can go in a certain direction, but doesn't really tell you what your location is. You can do an awful lot with a compass, and we think that compass systems are really central to solving the problem of that first migration to your first overwintering site in a great range of species. But it won't get you back anywhere with pinpoint accuracy unless you know exactly where you are. And for that, you need something more than a compass. You need some kind of map system which allows you to know which direction you have to take to get to your precise target. So what might a map system like this be based on? Well, lots of experiments to work this out have been done in homing pigeons, which famously can find their way back home from places they've never been to before. Most of this work points towards atmospheric odours, smells, being the primary source of sensory information for that map sense, at least over distances of tens or maybe a, a few hundreds of kilometres. But again, when you get very close, we think that visual landmark cues are probably the primary uh, sensory cues used by birds in that final kind of accurate stage of navigation. 
So birds use different cues from their surroundings, stars, smells, sights and magnetism to either build up a kind of map of where they are or to get a fix on the direction that they're travelling. Birds are likely born with at least some instructions about how to use these cues, but also appear to learn directions over their lives. As well as being fascinating in its own right, understanding how birds migrate is really important for conservation. In the last episode, we heard how some 40% of bird species globally are declining. And if human activity interferes with those stars, smells and sights that migratory birds rely on, then their journeys become even more precarious. And things are even worse for sea turtles. Every species is threatened or endangered, but protecting them is tricky because they travel so far and live in so many places. Nevertheless, that's what the Sea Turtle Conservancy is all about. We're a non-profit organization that was founded in 1959 in Florida. Uh, actually, the first organization in the world created specifically to study and protect sea turtles. This is David Godfrey, the captain who was so skillfully steering us earlier. He's also the organization's executive director. Well, sea turtles are very highly migratory, which is one of the reasons they're important indicators of the health of the world's oceans and coastal systems. They are born on land. As hatchlings, they circle around uh, the Atlantic, at least in this part of the world. There may be thousands of miles involved in that particular leg of their migration. And then they take up residency uh, near shore and spend you know, uh, perhaps a decade or more uh, in a place like this, where we're at now in Crystal River, Florida. And then they travel perhaps several hundred miles to an adult foraging site and take up residency there for another period of years. And then after that, every several years, every two or three years, they make these regular migrations back and forth from their adult foraging sites to their nesting sites. And throughout that process, they're almost constantly on the move. And it is that movement that we're studying here and learning about so that we can protect them wherever they are. It's one of the things we're trying to, to figure out is what do they do once they get to that almost adult stage? When do they leave and how do they travel? Where are they headed? Lots of really important questions for the protection of these animals. And to answer these questions, the team aims to follow the turtles on their oceanic voyages. It's been a busy day on the water and there are now three beautiful turtles peacefully resting on the deck of the boat, waiting to be examined by biologist Rick Heron. And so we've just seen in spectacular fashion Evan catch three turtles. Yes. Um, what are you What are you going to do now? What happens now? They're on the boat. They're sort of. Well, they seem very. They seem very chill. Yeah, out. they're like actually it's... very calm because they're up here. They're green turtles. They're cold. You know, they're cold-blooded animals. They're reptiles. They don't have. Whoa! You know, they are um, cold. Hey, buddy. Um, so how old would this guy be? That turtle's a lot bigger. Probably closer to you know. 12, 15 years old, yeah. Tend to, they tend to kind of go to sleep on the boat, just to rest. So big turtle here, what are you going to be measuring on this guy? We're going to tag them, we're going to um, collect blood from them, we're going to measure them, we're going to weigh them, we're going to photograph them, and probably this turtle, which looks like a good candidate, we're going to put a satellite transmitter on. This is what we're really here to see. Satellite transmitters can help you track a turtle for months or even years. So you guys are going to tag this one? Yeah, we're going to put a satellite tag on this one. Inside the device is a lot of very clever technology. Now it's about half the size of a cell phone, basically. It's got a wire-like flexible antenna that sticks out. And of course that is what links to the satellite so they can get a location on the turtle. Most of the tag has got these batteries in here. Yeah. And that's the limitation on these tags. And how does it work? It's on certain times of the um, day on a duty cycle and it's off at other times. There's a, a small current between the two metal parts of the tag that keep the tag off. And when it comes out of the water, that current is broken and the tag turns on. So because the, there's ions in the water that can yeah, transmit the current. Salt water is a great vector of electricity. How do you make sure it doesn't fall off the turtle and how do you stick it onto the turtle in the first place? The most important thing is that we Make sure that the surface of the turtle's shell or carapace is cleaned and roughened up with some sandpaper. And when we put the transmitter down, it is attached using epoxy resin or polyester resin to keep the transmitter attached to the, the shell of the animal. So we want to get at least six months to a year 
out of these attachments. This seems like a seamless way to plug one of our previous episodes called What Makes Stuff Sticky? which is about the unexpectedly fascinating science underpinning why anything gets stuck to anything else. You can find that and all up our shows on BBC Sounds. But back to this episode. Before we can stick a tracker on this marvellous specimen, there's work to do. Would you like to do some cleaning on the turtle to get it, get it worked up? Probably? Yeah, I'd love to. All right. Cool. So what do I need to do first? Uh, you need to grab a brush. <laughs> <laughs> This one? <laughs> yeah, that one. Okay, so just... It's a little just... wet, so you can dip it in the salt water. Yeah, cool. And, uh, you see this turtle's got, got some uh, silt on it. Yeah. A little massage for you. It's not a manicure. It's a shellicure. Way. <laughs> Get off. <laughs> Overboard. <laughs> Walk the plank. <laughs> back into it. Oh, I can, can yeah, I? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and what, what is the shell actually made from? Well, underneath is bone, but this is um, made out of keratin. Same thing your fingernails made out of. Yeah, they blend right in with the background of the seagrass. This is the sandpaper. I'm trying to rough up the surface of the, the shell. A slightly rough surface makes for better adhesion. Rick then builds up several layers of a special resin in the middle of the shell, which provides a base. And once they're all dried, it's time to attach the tracker. So you're putting the tag on the turtle now with this, with this heavy duty putty? Yes, and we're lining it up right down the center line on this second scoot. And the putty is, is the base. See, the turtle's carapace has a curvature to it, so the putty acts like a, a nice little platform. Now it's a matter of drying. You're listening to Crowd Science from the BBC World Service, where we're exploring the science of animal navigation. And I've got some pretty exciting news. Crowd Science has been given the prestigious honour of naming this majestic creature. We've decided to call it BB the sea turtle, because this is the BBC, after all. And you'll be able to follow BB's journey on the Sea Turtle Conservancy's website. We'll put a link to that and some pretty adorable photos on the episode webpage. BB is currently a young juvenile, but as an adult they'll migrate to a new feeding ground, which could be down into the Caribbean Sea, or even way, way out into the North Atlantic. But how will BB know where to go? Well, earlier we heard how birds can sense the Earth's magnetic field, but they aren't the only ones. It seems that magnetism is important for turtles too. Professor Ken Lohman from the University of North Carolina in the US is a man who has spent his career studying magnetosensing in animals. And before he got to turtles, he started on lobsters. During the fall, spiny lobsters undergo a really strange migration. They line up in immense single file head to tail lines and march offshore. So in some parts of the Bahamas, for example, there are uh, thousands of lobsters forming these lines and walking in specific directions. These reports of homing and the ability of lobsters to hold consistent headings during their migration uh, is what led us to uh, think initially about whether they might have the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field. These findings about bizarre migrating conga lines of spiny lobsters led Ken to turn his attention to sea turtles. He conducted some of the earliest experiments to investigate whether magnetism might also explain their abilities. In one experiment with the spiny lobsters, we constructed an underwater magnetic coil system so that we could reverse the magnetic field around lobsters. We basically tethered them in place and allowed them to walk in whatever direction they wanted to go. And then once they had established a course, we reversed the magnetic field. What we found was that most of the lobsters actually turned around and walked in the opposite direction. How did you go about trying to test whether turtles actually use magnetism to navigate? And why did you decide to look at magnetism as opposed to maybe other sensations that they might have been using, like olfaction or maybe their visual sense or ocean currents? With the turtles, we actually have looked at several different sensory systems. When we started the work, essentially nothing was known about how turtles navigate. We became interested initially in the baby turtles, the so-called hatchling turtles that have just emerged from their eggs. 
In Florida, where we've done most of the work, turtles leave the East Coast and swim directly offshore out to the Gulf Stream current. So it's a lengthy migration in which they're swimming more or less toward the east. When we started, our thought was perhaps they have a magnetic sense that guides them toward the east, and that will explain the offshore migration. As it turned out, it, it didn't. The turtles, when they first enter the water, pay attention to the direction of ocean waves, and that is the cue that they use initially to guide themselves offshore. But in carrying out these experiments, uh, we discovered that the turtles can, in fact, sense magnetic fields. They just use the magnetic information in a different way than we had originally envisioned. Ken's experiments have shown that turtles can use magnetism to help them navigate in two ways, like a compass and like a map. In the very beginning, we were looking at the use of the Earth's magnetic field as a kind of compass. And we set up a magnetic coil system around them so that we could alter the magnetic field in which, in which they were swimming. And we found that under certain circumstances, the turtles could indeed hold a consistent heading based on the magnetic field. And if we reverse the magnetic field, they would turn around and swim in the other direction. Later, we began to look at whether the turtles might be able to use the magnetic field as a source of positional information, or what is sometimes loosely referred to as map information, meaning simply, can, can they use the magnetic field to figure out something about where they are in the ocean. And it turns out that they can do this. They're exquisitely sensitive to several different uh, magnetic field uh, parameters. So why do turtles need to be able to use something like a magnetic field in order to, to navigate? I mean, can you give us a sense of where they're going in their life and why that might be a handy skill to have. The young loggerhead turtles that we study undertake an astonishing migration. They leave the southeastern U.S. coast, migrate offshore to the Gulf Stream, and then they embark on a migration that spans about 10,000 years and takes, takes them uh, eight or ten years to complete. Uh, so they, they cross the Atlantic, uh, they arrive uh, near the coast of uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, move south uh, along the northern coast of Africa, and eventually loop back to uh, North America. Uh, so it's a huge migration uh, covering uh, an immense distance, and there's a lot of danger for young turtles along the way. One of the main problems for them is that they are warm water turtles, and if they stray into water that is too cold for them, uh, they will die. Uh, so one function of their magnetic sense seems to be to, in essence, notify them that they are getting too far north so that they can adjust their swimming direction and remain within the warm water system. Uh, it turns out, however, that they actually inherit a series of responses that tell them what direction to swim when they encounter certain specific magnetic fields along their migratory route. So the turtles seem to actually inherit instructions that tell them how to complete this 10,000 mile migration, despite the fact that they've never been in the ocean before. So right from the moment they're born, these turtles need to be able to navigate accurately. It's quite literally a matter of life and death. Baby turtles don't have hard shells yet, and sadly, they make tasty snacks for predators. After hatching, they use moonlight to scuttle down to the water. Then they use wave direction to head out into open water. And over the next 10 years, they complete a huge loop through the ocean, taking refuge in seaweed and getting big enough to fend for themselves. According to Ken's experiments, at this stage in their lives, turtles instinctively respond to the different magnetic fields they hit along the way by swimming in different directions, and this helps to keep them on course. But as they get older, it seems turtles can do something much more sophisticated. They can learn the magnetic signature or address of different locations, like feeding sites. And that's what Ken's lab is currently investigating. One of his colleagues, Kayla Goforth, is running experiments to try and figure out how this might work. 
I'm really interested in how sea turtles relocate their foraging grounds. They show really strong fidelity to their feeding sites and they go back to the same one every year after making a lengthy migration. And so the hypothesis we had is that sea turtles may learn the magnetic field that's associated with a feeding site. And so to see if they can do this, the turtles are essentially trained to learn a specific magnetic field and they're fed only in one specific magnetic field um, every other day for about two months. And what we're gonna test today is whether or not the turtle is responding to that magnetic field and whether it learned it. Can you show us the setup? Yes. So we have a magnetic coil system and a magnetic coil system is really just a big frame. Oftentimes that's constructed out of wood and we wrap wire around it. And when you run a current through the wires that creates a magnetic field inside the coil. And we can control the magnetic field we're producing by changing the amount of current that we're running through the wires. So we put the turtle into the magnetic coil and it gets given the magnetic field that it's been fed in. Using this setup, Kayla can manipulate the magnetic field inside the coil, which you can see if you put a compass inside. When you put a compass inside, we can actually see the compass change directions and the turtle would be able to experience that change as well. You can see our red arrow for north uh -huh. is pointed approximately this way. And if we put it inside the coil, oh, wow, it, it flips completely directions. flips. Yeah. So we change north to actually be what west <laughs> would be. Okay. Wow, okay. It seems turtles can sense two different elements of a magnetic field the intensity of the field and the angle it makes with the Earth. Different locations on the planet will have a unique combination of this angle and intensity, and so the turtles can use them as magnetic coordinates, a bit like latitude and longitude. Kayla is testing whether turtles can associate food with a specific set of these coordinates, just like they might do in the wild. The baby turtles have always been fed in the presence of this artificial magnetic field, and they'll respond to it in a frankly adorable way if they've learned that it's linked to food. We'll see whether or not it exhibits what we call the turtle dance, <laughs> where they get really excited because they think they're going to get fed. So there's lots of rapid flipper motions. They're often spinning around. They're looking up as if expecting food to fall down on them. And yeah, it's very cute. <laughs> All that's missing now is some turtles. So this is the room where you keep all the baby turtles. Yes. <laughs> this is their home. So how many do you have? We have 16 loggerhead turtles. Um, they all came from Bald Head Island, North Carolina. We collect them in August and they spend about a year with us. And then they'll get released in July back to the ocean. <laughs> and they're all named after rappers this year. <laughs> We've got a Tupac, a Kanye, a Notorious B.I.G., Queen Latifah. <laughs> Doing experiments with turtles is tricky, I guess, because a lot of sea turtles are endangered or, or threatened as species, right? Many turtles are endangered. Loggerheads are listed as threatened now. So we have to get a lot of permits from the state um, and approvals from the university to do this research. Okay, so we're going to take one of these upstairs to, to the lab for an experiment? Yep. Amazing, let's go. So we have to take the turtles up the elevator. <laughs> So this box has got uh, one, well, the subject of today's experiment yeah. inside, and uh, the name of this turtle is the Notorious B.I.G. It is the Notorious B.I.G. Okay. Um, it is a loggerhead turtle, and he's about eight months old. He's going to be our test subject today. Oh my god. Um, Biggie is yeah. so cute. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, we won't hold you up too long. Just nice to meet you, Biggie. So you're going to yeah. go, you've got to clamber into the coil. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Biggie's in. And now he'll sit here in an acclimation period. It's about 15 to 20 minutes. And then the magnetic field will change. And we'll see if he responds to it by turtle dancing. Notorious B.I.G., the baby turtle, that's a phrase I'd never thought I'd say, is placed inside a bucket of water inside the magnetic coil. And we wait for the field to change. Okay, so you've actually got like a map on your computer which shows you where the magnetic field is sort of mimicking. Yeah, the map is on there and it, it basically shows us that we're producing fields that are near the east coast of the US and in the Caribbean. The field has been changed. <laughs> so now the turtle's in Haiti, and we'll see what it does. 
Yeah. Oh, there, I can hear it going. Can you hear this? You can hear the flippers on the side of the bucket sometimes. <laughs> but you can go ahead and look. <laughs> so what you can just about hear is the sound of Biggie Smalls, the turtle, swimming up against the edges of the bucket, kind of wiggling its front flippers, bringing its head above the surface in a, a little turtle dance because it's hungry. Hoping that some food's going to come down because that's what's happened in the past. Yeah. Wow. Well, clever experiment. Hi. I don't have anything for you, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's just these mean experimenters playing tricks on you. I mean, that is just sickeningly cute, isn't it? I, I need to leave immediately. <laughs> So it does look like Biggie the turtle can recognise the magnetic signature of a location that's linked to food. This research is helping to fill in the gaps about how sea turtle navigation might work in the wild. For a long time we've known that they can navigate using Earth's magnetic field and they do it kind of with a, a magnetic map that allows them to identify locations. But a really big part of that idea of using a map is that they can learn magnetic fields or learn that specific magnetic coordinates are associated with something. And until now, we didn't really have any actual evidence of that, but the initial results from this are supporting that that is likely the case. And then I guess one of the big questions is how are they sensing the Earth's magnetic field? Is that something that we know? That's something that everybody in this field really wants to know. There are three major hypotheses for how they might do it. So the first of these is called the biogenic magnetite hypothesis. And this suggests that there could be small particles of magnetite, which is basically like a small mineral, it's like a tiny magnet in their brains. And this magnet might be attached to like a receptor and it would stretch or bend that receptor when it experiences a change in Earth's magnetic field. The second hypothesis is chemical magnetoreception. And this suggests that there are complex chemical reactions that provide animals with a magnetic sense. And those reactions are influenced by Earth's magnetic field. And then the third hypothesis is electromagnetic induction. And so that is when an electrically conductive object, like a little circuit, if it moves through a magnetic field, a voltage is induced across it, and the strength of that voltage depends on the strength of the magnetic field. So something that could function as that circuit in an animal are the semicircular canals. In the ear? Yep, in the ear. Yep, they're fluid-filled, and fluid is conductive. So three different theories for how turtles might sense the Earth's magnetic field magnetic particles, chemical reactions, or organs that work like electric circuits. Researchers don't yet know which one of these is the case, let alone how it might lead to nerve impulses or how those signals are then interpreted by the brain, although there is a lot of work happening in this area. But there has been a lot more progress on the way magnetic sensors might work in other animals, such as birds. And for some scientists, trying to figure out this mystery has been a bit of a lifelong quest. I was interested in birds and animals since I was 10 years old. And as a teenager, I ran around with a one kilo heavy mobile phone and I was called any time a rare bird was seen anywhere in Denmark and I tried to go and see it. And at some stage, I started to wonder what went wrong in that bird's head when a bird from Mongolia turned up in Denmark. So that was kind of the beginning. This is Henrik Muritsen from Oldenburg University in Germany. He's been studying bird navigation for decades and together with a British chemist, testing out one of the theories that Kayla just mentioned, that it's to do with complex chemical reactions. Basically, it suggests that a molecule absorbs light. This light is used to move an electron within the molecule. And then you get two unpaired electrons and magnetic fields can influence these electrons. And in this way, birds could in principle sense the Earth's magnetic field. It's quite complicated science, but a simplified version is that electrons normally like to be in pairs. Unpaired electrons are known as radicals. The theory goes that there could be a molecule which produces not one, but two radicals when it absorbs light. And importantly, this pair of radicals can be influenced by a magnetic field, and the bird could use this to sense magnetism. And because it's based on a light-sensitive molecule, this could even be tied to the bird's visual system. In theory, could it mean that the birds could see the, the magnetic field, that there would be, it would be kind of in the same way that their visual system can help them to see light, that they'd also be able to see the magnetic field? Yeah, the consequence is that birds would see the magnetic field. To them, it would be a visual impression. 
The mechanism would be different than other types of vision, but it would be processed in a visual brain region, and therefore to the bird, it would be kind of a visual image. So maybe birds have an extra layer of vision on top of brightness and colour and UV so that they can literally see the Earth's magnetic field. Now we should say that researchers are far from proving this is how it happens, and there are other theories out there, but it's a fascinating idea. Henrik has been exploring the molecules that could be the key to this mechanism, called cryptochromes. Well, there are about six different cryptochromes in birds, and, but there's only one so far where we have demonstrated that it has a critical building block called flavin, which is the building block that absorbs the light. That one has only been proven in one that's called cryptochrome 4A. And in that particular molecule, uh, when light is absorbed, you get these radical pairs formed and the cryptochrome 4 is only located in the retina, in the outer segments of um, photoreceptor cells. These are basically the cells in the eye that absorbs light uh, in, on a daily basis. So cryptochrome 4 sounds like it could be quite a promising candidate. What kinds of uh, tests have you been doing uh, in the lab to kind of see whether this could be playing a role? We got the DNA sequence out from a bird and then we took this DNA sequence and put it into a cell culture, so into an E. coli cell culture. And we asked now these bacterial cell to make the cryptochrome 4 from the migratory bird. And then we succeeded in doing that. And then we, we, we then had the molecule in our hands for the first time. And then we basically sent these molecules to uh, Oxford University in the UK, where we have very good colleagues in the chemistry departments who have unique spectroscopy. That's basically ways to study this molecule. And they could show that indeed, when light is shone on this molecule, it generates radical pairs. And these radical pairs, the, their formation is magnetic field dependent. Henrik and his colleagues have successfully managed to create their own version of cryptochrome 4 in the lab from the bird's DNA, which sounds straightforward but has taken a lot of people a lot of time and effort. And it seems like cryptochrome 4 could have the right properties for this mechanism. Well, there are many things, there are a lot of circumstantial evidence by now, but the most important thing is that this whole radical pair mechanism can only work if the cryptochrome has a cofactor called flavin. That's a little additional building block. And if it doesn't have that flavin, then it doesn't absorb light and there are no radical pair form. And so far, cryptochrome 4A is the only cryptochrome from any bird that has been shown to have this flavin inside it. So this is obviously the beginning, I suppose, of, of uh, potentially the beginning of the mechanism, the molecule that, that is, uh, is the basis of the sensation. I'm just wondering, do we know anything about, for example, in the brain? Is there anywhere where you can see readings where the, the bird is sort of detecting or, or sensing magnetic fields? Well, I mean, these molecules are in the eye, so it needs to sit where light comes in. So it sits in the, these so-called photoreceptor cells in the eye. Then they are processed in neurons in the eye. And then this information is sent to the brain via the optic nerve. And we could show that there is a particular part of the bird's forebrain called cluster N, that this area is highly active when birds perform magnetic compass orientation. And if you now do a behavioral experiment in which you make this brain area dysfunctional, then the birds can't use their magnetic compass anymore, but they can use their sun compass and their star compass without any problems. So it sounds like there's lots of evidence, lots of pieces of the puzzle that point towards cryptochrome 4 as being the basis of this, this, um, this sense in birds. What do you think are sort of the next stages? Like what kinds of experiments or what things would you need to show to be able to say, aha, we know now that it is this molecule? Well, it would be lovely if we could knock it out so that, you know, in mice, it's very easy nowadays to knock out a specific protein so that the mouse doesn't have a specific protein. That's a lot more complicated than a night migratory songbird because we can't breed them in captivity. But if you could make a, a bird or you could influence a bird so that it wouldn't have any cryptochrome 4 in its eye, that would be quite interesting to test its navigational capabilities.
Yeah, that does. That sounds like the next the next step. Is that something that might be possible in the future? We are working on it since quite a while. <laughs> That's very exciting. Um, I mean, is it is it quite quite an interesting time to be working in this field? Like, what would you what do you think you, your you know the childhood version of yourself who was wandering around Denmark with this huge mobile phone? What do you think he would have said to the research that you're doing now? He would definitely never have believed that I would have been having to understand something about quantum mechanics and that I would actually be looking at single electrons jumping inside a molecule and based on how those electrons jump, I would be able to gain additional understanding about how birds find their ways. If you had told me that 30 years ago, I would have said no way. I would (laughs) never get there. Henrik's research shows just how many mysteries there are still to unravel when it comes to the science of animal navigation. Back in the time of the ancient Greeks, Aristotle's explanation of where birds went for the winter was that some species magically transformed into others. But is the truth really any less incredible? We know that animals use everything from sights and smells to the stars and the sun, as well as magnetic fields, to figure out where they are and which direction they're heading. And scientists around the world are tracking these animals with bands, transmitters and even DNA to build maps and spot trends. And this knowledge is more crucial today than ever as the climate crisis and habitat destruction continues to encroach on the natural world, changing the landscapes these species have relied on for thousands of years. But our journey on the show has come to an end. So it's time to say thanks once again to Moses for your brilliant question and bon voyage to BB the sea turtle. So we've got the tag on, painstakingly applied. Hopefully that she gives us lots of information on where she's going. Right, should we do it? You ready? Yeah, you ready? All right. Get a good look at that water. Yep. And she's ready to go herself. They don't stick around, do they? No. She knows where she wants to be. (laughs) And it's not on this boat anymore. (laughs) Awesome. This episode was presented by me, Anand Jagatia, and produced by Melanie Brown. If you have a question that you'd like an answer to, then you can drop a quick email to crowdscience at bbc.co.uk. Until next time.